Hi, uh, welcome to the talk uh, about how hard uh, can it be to interf interface a Linux system. And let me introduce Harald Hoyer, uh, plumber's hacker, uh, out author of Dracut, UDEV, uh, initiator of user move, and many other things. Uh, and he will tell you something about the Wirelink. Harald, it's Thank yours. you, André. So in the last 20 plus years, we always encountered the same problem. And let me describe the problems we had with Linux systems. And then I will present a solution um, designed and created by Lars Kalitsky and Kai Sievers. Kai Sievers works in my team and author of UDEF also. Uh, let's start. How hard can it be to interface a Linux system? So as Andre said, I'm the author of Dracut, and in Dracut, we support multiple Linux distributions, so we try to be as agnostic to a Linux distribution as possible. So we have to ask what uh, command line utility supports as, a, as a options. And how do we do this? We ask for the version and then pass the version string and uh, according to whatever major version we use this or that feature. But it can be even harder if you pass co more complicated versions like for LVM. And uh, we have to use um, CLI tools for most of the storage related things because there exists no other possibility in Dracut, for example, or most of the time uh, other Tools like Ansible or, or Cockpit cannot use something else, so they have to directly call that. And of course, you have to use some versions, uh, options according to your version. And for some other tools, we just gave up. We uh, passed minus minus help and passed the output then to see if that matches <laughs> our needs. But what if some output changes unexpectedly? For example, multipath, listing all the multipath devices, normally just lists you the multipath devices. But at Red Hat, somebody thought it would be nice to have some error messages if the configuration file is missing. So the end script just outputs, oh, we have an error with January. There's no January DM setup table. In Cockpit, we also have like 60 calls to CLI tools and parsing the output of those. The very simple one is uh, the SA status. And then you have to basically parse key values. And uh, every higher level tool has to implement those parsers. In Ansible, for example, it's even more. Uh, Advanced, yeah. <laughs> when Ansible installs RPM uh, packages with yum, yum is written in Python, Ansible is written in Python, um, they decide to just pass the error message, the plain English error message, and react upon this. So it's really parsing human readable output and act upon this output. So Current workarounds, print zero was some of that where you have spaces in there and you don't want to make the, the error of uh, missing the space in file names. Other workarounds are specifying what you want to see in the output, like here with find mount, or even with DM setup where you get a shell evil possible environment variable which you can work with. And then the workarounds go as far as LS block outputting JSON. So that's really advanced <laughs> in case of uh, CLI tools. So the basic root of the problem is parsing human readable output to get machine processable inputs. And we don't have a common machine readable output format for all the tools. We, that's like learning English, Spanish, Italian all the time. And every tool, higher level tool has to do this all the time. 
the APIs, the formats, options are baked into the tools and they're hard to discover. So I, cannot, I can only ask the man page what the output should look supposedly like. But it's not often the case. So you have to try and hope for the best that it never changes. And of course, it's often not probably documented. So the current system API is hard to grasp for non-developers. As a non-developer, you have no clue. You might use cockpit to hide all these things. And we have many different domains, files, syscalls, sockets, dbus, proprietary protocols. They are complex to document version and extent, especially extent in most of the time. You cannot test them for correctness because it's not even documented or or strongly typed or strongly defined what the options are. And it's even impossible to use from another machine. You have to SSH in there, inject some Python, what not, what Ansible is doing, and then interfacing with that machine. Because there's no entry point, no defined entry point to that machine. So there were historical visions of a system API, LSP, try to document what is available on a system, what are the standard interfaces to uh, enable a service to query the status of a service and whatnot, and the glibc functions which should be available, all that stuff. For IPC, it was decop corba which you can introspect maybe here and there, and then came along Dbus. Then another, then the LMI project, which uh, died but uh, was an effort to, to create something like a system OS API. And nowadays, uh, Microsoft is implementing the, the same thing again with PowerShell for Linux systems. So let's talk more about Dbus problem. It was tried the last 13 years. It was kind of a company policy to have a Dbus API for new things which we write. But it's most of the time developers saw how complicated it is to add Dbus support for the client and for the server. And they just didn't do that. And often more the, the code which you need for Dbus support was way bigger than the actual tool which you wanted to uh, have a Dbus interface for. For CLI utilities, it's of course not suitable. And it needs the stable running Dbus daemon, which of course isn't the case in the Android one of S or in small environments, or in the early boot even. The API is hard to extend, so it's more like uh, positional parameters, or there are workarounds which then lead to some dictionaries which are undefined, basically. Um, it has simple types only, positional parameters I talked about, and the introspection format is most of the time not really documented or useless in the documentation. So it's like this, if you introspect create session in systemd, it might not give you a good documentation of what argument one, zero, or whatnot is for. But even if you have a nice documentation of network manager route data, um, it's just an array of a dictionary, basically, and the documentation, what is allowed in there is in the documentation and has additional attributes which are not very specified. It's a wild card out of the system, the, out of the Dbus uh, argument type G variant limitation because you cannot extend that easily. For open LMI, it was basically an API with no consumer. That's, these are the quotes from the open LMI um, project aftermath. It was hard to understand, hard to use, heavy end resources, and nobody knew how to use that and how to write their own things. PowerShell does the same right now, and what they're doing underneath looks like the same thing. Grab, AWK, 
housing, piping, and whatnot. It's just ugly. And this is what we give to them to interface a Linux system. That's their, their idea of how to come to the data they need to export in PowerShell. So we came up with, we thought about what would an ideal API look like. It should be documented, of course. It should be discussable. That means if I give you the interface definition, we can talk about it without having to learn how Dbus A, A, S, V is possible in your head. Uh, it should be testable. You can give the interface definition to a QE guy and he can write tests according to that one file without knowing the implementation details. And of course, it should be extensible. Machine readable is the first goal, of course, and human readable is nice to have also. It should be a minimal overhead so it, that you can add that to your existing command line utilities. It should be discoverable so that you ask the system which interfaces you have, which APIs you provide. You should get a real clean answer. It should be remotable, easy, proxable, and of course, it should be as simple as possible. The benefit documented is self-explanatory, saves time and money, maybe even prevents those misunderstandings than if you and additional attributes in the documentation might mean anything which can lead to this situation here. And as I said before, having this one file where I can talk about with QE, with customers, with product managers, with developers, it's key for communication because communication should be the one thing, priority. So I have the points here again, and we try to make Varlink have a check mark on all these points. And it defines a clean interface definition, definition format, an IDL, which also carries documentation, has an easy to implement IPC using simple and established technologies like JSON, allows to naturally extend interfaces to reduce the need for version numbers so you can add things of course, when you take away things, then you're not comfortable anymore. But if you can add things and they have maybe default parameters, then if they are left out from old clients, it makes programmatic testing simpler and whatnot. So this is an example for an interface definition file. And I guess everybody can read that without uh, having troubles understanding what it does, method calls, Definition of types. We have like three, oh no, we, we have four keywords and three types, so that's six keywords in there, and the rest should be self explanatory. It's human readables, and it allows everybody to talk about that system architects, developers, QA, and customers. The protocol is that simple, it's JSON, it's just peer-to-peer -peer and one message after the other. And it's extensible, remotable, you can easy map that to, for example, the HTTP protocol. And with that you could, in the end game, build a well-defined system API. And that is accessible from the outside, from, so you can basically access from a container the host API, maybe if you just give it a one connection to route through. And we created a simple CLI tool so you can play around with it, see the output. Here we, for example, we call the Comrade Hat system account service with the method get by name. We specify the name. And that's just a proof of concept. It's just a CLI. You would have language bindings in Python, in Java, in Rust, so you don't need to call that CLI. You can natively talk that protocol very easily. And with that, 
CLI tool, we also explored the possibility of calling an executable directly and talk to it via FD3 as a standard out, standard in uh, addition. So we pass it a socket where it can listen on and you can talk to that. Make several connections to it, call several methods in parallel even then if you have multiple connections. You can even do that, encapsulate the, the protocol in SSH or if you later want in TLS or whatever. We added, because we, our, because it should be uh, discoverable and it should be introspectable, all services have their interface definition. Uh, as a service, you can query the interface definition, so you can, for example, in Python, then make dynamic bindings to the, those services very easily by just parsing the uh, introspection data. And also we wrote a kernel interface so to make a proof of concept that it can even be used as a interface to, for user space to the kernel with extensible um, structures. So the problem like you have with ioculus and stuff like that where you cannot extend the structure or change the structure in between goes away. So to, to show how easy it is in Python, it's just from varlink import client, then get the interface, call the method, get the output, and it's all natively in Python, very easy to use, dynamically created by interface uh, introspection. So if you want to know more about Varlink or use the uh, language bindings, you should go to varlink.org. There you find also the Python Varlink bindings. You find the Linux kernel module if you, play, or if you want to play around with that. And in the Python Varlink, there's a documentation how you install that on Fedora, like enable the Varlink copper, which packages to download, and how to turn off SE Linux because <laughs> of stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I would like to make now the, the query and answer section. I guess you, had, you have a lot of questions. Dan Walsh. So the question was, how do we start the user space to yeah, I mean, use that? So yeah, we will, we will try to add Varling to some of the tools which meets it, needs it the most, like, like basically all the storage tools, <laughs> the storage CLI tools and probably also to the IP tool, so you can then programmatically uh, interface or set up the network via the IP tool, which already has all the uh, possibilities. And then it should move up the stack, so if you write new things, you should probably also have a varlink interface or a dbus service and if you're writing a Debus service, it should be far simpler to add also a Varlink interface. So, for storage point of view, I'm all open to up to another Varlink interface, but all I need here is what are the states where the system is not in a valid state, like you have duplicated device, you have all sorts of programs, What do you mean? You have an inconsistent system state? And you have two of them with the same name, for instance. So, you know, not everything will always work. Yeah, if, if the, if the he, he's asking about uh, 
what if the system is in an inconsistent state and if you have d devices with the same name, what do you do about it? But that's not the problem. The protocol Varlink itself has to solve. That is the problem. What your tool then has to re output, maybe it outputs two devices with the same name. So the, the, the consumer of your data, which your tool normally outputs in human readable format and now outputs in, in machine readable format, it's the same data in the end, but machine readable and maybe easier to access and maybe Uh, but, but these are problems in your area and uh, that does have nothing to do with uh, command line interface and protocols and IPC and APIs. There's uh, the, the concept of signals. Basically, you want to subscribe to a service and then get notified if something um, is happening. We have that. We have such a thing like a monitor call, which then never ends or ends only if the, if the service then decides that there will be no more data. Uh, so if you're exploring the, the uh, proof of concept examples, you will see um, the IO system, the journal, um, service which then provides you with uh, log entries and you can constantly monitor the log entries which gives you a stream of log entries. So that's possible. But you have to subscribe to the service directly and you cannot uh, do some signal wildcard matching on the bus. There's no bus. It's a point-to-point -point protocol. So he's asking for some confirmation that you are now subscribed to some event source. And um, this can be, you can have easy solutions. So the first entry is an, the first answer from the service after subscribing can be an empty element or whatnot to just show you that you will now receive elements and that it worked for you. We, we, we didn't want to put that into the protocol. We didn't want to enforce this. So it's up to you to. Hold on. So the question is, uh, what about the old uh, DBus services like Network Manager? How would they transition to Varlink? Would it make sense to, or how hard is it to, to, to move to a Varlink interface? I would guess it's pretty easy because the method names can be the same and the dictionaries, you can finally describe the contents of those wildcard dictionaries like you saw in, in my Network Manager example with the route. All the wildcard dictionaries go away and then you specify what you have in your code. Of course, it's harder because you now have to finally describe what you're returning or accepting as an input.
But that's uh, a good exercise because then you have already also documented what you are providing as an API. Yeah, I had the idea too, but as you saw, most of the, 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 the debus things is uh, dictionaries in, in that space for network manager. So you get just a dictionary and you cannot auto-generate anything out without looking into the documentation in the comment strings or in the source code in the end. So the question is, how do I find my services on the system? Um, initially, where's the entry point? So we created the resolver and the actuator service in Varlink, and there's a well-defined uh, Unix domain socket file in slash run, which defines the very entry for you to query which services interfaces are available on your system. And from there you can go further, it just gives you the, like a DNS resolver, basically. So you want to use, uh, the question is how to interface the container, can I basically manage the users in the container. I see we are out of time, but i answer this one. Um, the same time you do it, uh, the same thing you do it with Ansible, for example, SSH into it. Uh, I had the example of calling it with SSH. So that would be a possibility, or you have a well-defined uh, file descriptor going from the host into the container anyway. With you, with whatever mechanism you pass through. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.